there's a derrick off to the south just being drilled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You go up on the ridge, there's 16, 17, right, you know, I can see from here. And those are all, all new Bakken wells. But in another five years, there'll, there'll probably be, you know, if there's 17 wells here now, there'll probably be 47. I w it wouldn't surprise me, the way they're, the way they're talking. This program is funded by the North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. I'll be 10 8. I've been with the Sheriff's Office since December, so it'll be almost a year. I used to work for the Williston Police Department. I left and went to the oil field for six months. I missed this too much and came back. Typical day would just be patrolling and making sure everything's all right in the county, running traffic. You know, everybody used to be excited for a Friday night because that's when the action would happen. It doesn't matter if it's Friday anymore. It could be Monday, it could be Sunday, and just crazy. I patrol Williams County, and we're running quite thin. There's a bar in town, and Friday, Saturday nights, it's pretty much expected to go to that bar at 1 a.m. for a bar fight. The weapons calls have increased drastically. You know, there's prostitution, of course, you know. The traffic has gotten horrible. Before, you could make it across town in five minutes, if that. Now it takes 20. This is the, uh, the RV park. You'll be driving by one day, nothing will be here. You'll drive by the next day, and boom, it's here. We've gotten calls frequently just because there's so many people moving in. The people we have here now are not like the people, you know, we still deal with our locals, of course, you know, the frequent flyers, if you will, but there are people here now who they don't, they don't care if you're a cop or not. They don't care if you're telling them to do something. It, it doesn't matter to them. It's, it is very stressful and it's very concerning. At three in the morning, on a Monday night, you could, wouldn't see a car downtown Williston, right on the highways at all. Now it's just all night steady. Cars, people walking, steady. It was in April of 51 that they hit oil. Amarada Petroleum at that time were uh, leasing land and they come around and lease to my dad anyhow. And I'm sure when he leased it, he just thought, wasting their time coming up here to North Dakota to drill for oil. And it was really exciting when they started, you know, we'd never seen anything like that before. They'd come down with uh, truck after truck of, of uh, oil well parts and, and then they got it all, finally got it all put together and then they started drilling and, and people in North Dakota were used to seeing anything like that. They'd come up Sundays and, and uh, just to see what was going on. And, and it was quite a bit of traffic and people were pretty excited about, about the first oil rig in North Dakota. You know, every time you'd go to town, and so everybody would ask you, well, they hit oil yet? They hit oil yet? No, 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 no. Yeah. And then they were hoping it would develop into something that's profitable. They knew they had oil there, but they didn't know how much. At that time, oil was only $3 a barrel, so folks didn't make too much money off their oil. You know, now it's a lot different. If they come up and want a mineral rights, you know, they'd probably get uh, $50 an acre if you get that much, you know. And uh, 
Now they, they get a tremendous amount of money for an acre. A lot of times I'll drive past the farm and go turn around at the monument and, and look at it and remember the excitement that was back in them in the old days. Oh, I'm Pudge, and we come to Williston to work in the oil fields. Pretty busy every day. Uh, come out in the morning and get all the trucks running and get the drivers in them and get them sent out to haul gravel. I guess the biggest challenge is getting truck parts and tires and that kind of thing. It's getting a lot better because more companies are moving in. We worked in another oil boom in Colorado. That's, that's where we were before this one. And uh, after that shut down, we were hauling equipment up, up here to Williston for the construction companies that build the locations and stuff. And then we just got connected with some of the companies and come up to haul gravel for them. I think we've ruined their little town here. It was a nice town, and, and now it's just crazy, like a big city. Our lands are checkerboard, meaning some parcels are fee and some are trust. So the, the companies came and drilled where they could drill quicker, which is, of course, on the fee land, which is off the reservation, and then on the fee land within the reservation. A lot of the lands here were uh, leased, perhaps for farming or grazing. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, takes care of those leases on behalf of uh, tribal members. We're one of the few tribes where we can actually own land. There are tribes where all land is tribal. Because it's trust land, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has a lot of say over how those lands will be managed. And as an allottee is what they call those of us who have a share of land, the Bureau has a lot to say on what takes place on our individual lands. And as a, as a result of, the, of course, the unique relationship with the government, we have a forced dependency on them. I feel fortunate to get to be an allottee, a landowner. At the same time, I am not like a Jane Doe out there who, when they come on her land and want to drill, it's a matter of weeks they can get a drilling permit. For my land, being that it's in trust status, it's comparable to a national park. The Bureau, the government, with that um, dependency that I have to have with them because of their control, you could say, over us, they're supposed to watch out for my lands. And there are 46 steps that had to be taken in order for us to get a, to the point where we can have the company drill, and that's down to the drilling permit. Many of us went broke in the mid-80s, uh, and I'm included, um, flat broke. You know, we, we all made some money back in the 70s, and we parlayed it and leveraged it, and um, we didn't, quite frankly, we didn't have enough money to leave town. And if we'd have left town, I'd probably be looking on the outside saying, geez, I wish I'd have stayed there. Those of us that chose to work with the banks that survived are all doing fairly well right now. Those of us that uh, declared war with the bank, the bank won. And uh, most of those folks are gone. We're 24-7. That's why I've just been on one job this morning. Now I'm headed to another job. I'll probably be up at least 28 hours. I've been up uh, 64 hours before, straight, yeah. It's changed a lot. There were 46 rigs when I first came up here. There's over 200 now. I've been up here six months straight, so um, that's quite a long time. I'm supposed to be on a, a 28 and 14 rotation, but that doesn't always happen. It's hard. It really is, it's hard. The, the elements are brutal and then on top of that, it's a mental thing because they're away from their families. But thank God that we have a place in the United States that's really, it is, it's rolling. It's providing a lot of income for a lot of people all over the United States. It 
it's kind of heartbreaking to go out there and, and the wide open spaces that you've known as a kid and rode through and chased cattle all your life is, 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 is changing with roads and oil development. And uh, that's the hard thing for me to, to look at, knowing that it, it'll never be the same or my grandkids will never remember it like I do. We run cattle out here since in the 50s. And uh, this is kind of the impact you see on, our, on the grassland. Uh, uh, a lot of roads and, and uh, lots of flares. There's too much wellhead pressure, so the, the pipeline can't take all the gas, so they have to burn the excess. If you can hear that flare, it just kicked on. They, they, it, it comes bubbles of gas once in a while, and it really, it, there it went back down again. It, it just comes a burst every once in a while of the, of the gas. Yeah, it sure doesn't bother the cows any there. Everywhere you look, there's wells. They kind of paint them to look natural to the surroundings. Did you tell Grandma about your gymnastics? Years ago, my other grandfather on my mom's side, he ran into some tough luck and, and uh, he traded a lot of his minerals uh, to help buy a new tractor or a new car. The local dealer, he, uh, he took those in on trade. And that's the way it was with a lot of our neighbors too, that during the depression and, and uh, the tough times, in order to keep the farm and ranch going, they, they sold off some of their minerals to pay some bills. If you were fortunate you know, to, to got some land 30, 40 years ago, and maybe some of the mineral rights came along with the surface, you're pretty lucky. But if you've bought anything in the last, well, since the last boom, uh, none of the, mineral rights went along with the surface, hardly any of it. The countryside is what really gets me, I guess, is the way the landscape is going to change the amount of wells here and there, and it sounds like they're going to be here for quite a while. Good for the state of North Dakota. There's some hardships that come with it. It's probably good in the end, and we'll learn to live with it like we did before. We'll adjust. You know, it don't matter to me, I'll haul whatever they need hauled. Pretty much it's all about trying to make as much money as you can while you're up here. What I've been told is I'm allowed 14 hours a day. And two of them, as long as two of them are resting, or are waiting in line, just kind of relaxing. But you can run seven days a week. Some people can't or get out here and try it, and don't uh, stick with it, they don't like it. Um, I heard winter is going to be real fun. I've heard of a lot of people have uh, wrecked trucks for not being experienced, or and all, it always almost always seems they're going too fast for the conditions. So it's just a matter of you know not getting stupid. Well, we. Uh used to just haul bulk fuels to the farmers. And then we set up this card troll outfit out here six years ago and didn't see any way it was gonna ever pay out. <laughs> then the oil field came to town and we've been a little busy since then, added on the towing business, moved to this new location. It used to be once the drills were parked, the sprayers were done in June, I'd take a 10 day vacation and ride my motorcycle, but that hasn't happened for two years now. <laughs> We're putting in light poles and actually something other than mud to park in. I have this waiting list that wants to get in on this, and I don't know how many we can get in there. We got 250 feet of space. I've had guys that have been here for three years. They pay me 150 a month. In the winter, they plug in. There are a lot more trucks than there is acres to park. I guess I haven't seen a Hawaii license plate on a truck yet, but everywhere else, Alaska on down. The jobs are here, but finding a place to live is harder. People living in their trucks yet. Well, the last city council meeting I went to, they had 30 building permits that day. And they weren't just single housing, they were multiple housing. 
in the beginning, the city was pretty cautious about allowing anything to happen. They didn't want to get infrastructured out and have years to pay and nothing to draw back on, you know, so. And I think that's pretty much Western North Dakota is set up that way in their heads. Well, it'll go away someday. That's kind of how I got here the last time when it, I was in the oil field when it bellied up in 30 days. People don't believe it does it that fast, but it does. When it rolls up and leaves town, it's gone, boom. I do this part time. I work in the oil field uh, during the week. I work here on Saturdays. It's a very busy place, but truck sales are the big thing. We have a lot of companies buying trucks. 60 to 75 trucks and vehicles a month as usual. That's a lot of vehicles in a smaller dealership in a small town like this. We're one of the top four dealers in the, in the nation for moving vehicles right now for this size dealership. And that's because everybody needs a vehicle up here, which is good for us. And I imagine Chevrolet and Dodge and everybody else are doing just as well in this area. Every place you go, there's workers wanted or help wanted signs anywhere in Williston. If you went by McDonald's, you see it's closed at seven because they have no employees. So a lot of the restaurants are that way in this town. There's oil field workers. Everybody wants to come to work in the oil field, but they, don't, they can't bring their family, so there's nobody to work in any of the other jobs. The town is a nice town. If it just has to, it's got a lot of growing pains it's gonna go through for a while. I don't know how they did it in the old days, but this one's having a tough one. You can tell the difference between the people that are from North Dakota and the people that are from somewhere else. You know, suddenly our stores are filled up with these people that just look different. When they speak, you can tell their accents are different and such. They're city drivers. When I came back, I would be driving down the road and the car coming in front of me would be saying, and I'd say, you know, who is that? I always try to figure out who it was in the beginning and then after a while I thought, oh, that's just North Dakota. But that's changing. <laughs> you know, there's, we're getting different types of hand signals. These city drivers, they don't wave high. They give you another uh, form of dress or something on the road if you're going too slow or something. They let you know in no uncertain terms that they're not pleased with you. So you can tell from that they're generally not from these small communities. Well, the city has two major issues. One being employees, because just like the other retailers and the other people that are in the city of Williston um, that aren't in the oil field, it's hard to compete with oil field wages. We're constantly running short of policemen, people to pick up the garbage fix the streets. Our building department, what did they say, that there was gonna be $300 million worth of building done in the city of Williston this year? And with that, you have to permit them all, you have to inspect them all. Our fire chief is just running ragged by going to inspect the sprinkler systems and all these things. And the other challenge is with our infrastructure, our sanitation plant, our sewage plant, we can't handle what's, what's coming at us right now didn't realize that the changes were going to be so dramatic so fast. Uh, the oil companies, once they start wrapping up, they just bring in truckloads of materials and truckloads of people and, and they just start building. Where we have to go through a planning process and trying to make some kind of order out of this thing, they just decide, well, we're gonna build here, you get a sewer and water, here it is. You know, Williston was maybe 13,000. Now we've got 9,700 man camp units alone in Williams County, plus all the other people that are living in, in basements and in hotels and stuff. I'm guessing it might be 30,000 that are living around here now. We've gone from a nice North Dakota-sized town to a big, booming town, and it's, it's not all that good. Not a man camp. We personally prefer the term lodge just due to the fact that yes, there has been some controversy over this subject. Several of the people in the community have a negative outlook on a man camp because I think they were afraid that everyone would build these camps 
And then when all of this is over, everyone would just leave. With Capital, we don't have that issue. We prefer to be considered more of a lodging facility due to the fact that we do try to achieve the home away from home atmosphere here. And when everything is done, this facility can actually remain as its own subdivision. All of these units can be converted to single family housing and then the dome can actually be used as a recreation center. We have 560 rooms. We have two phases. Each phase has 40 units with seven rooms per unit. Each room has two beds, separate bathroom, and it even has a somewhat walk-in closet. Every unit has a kitchenette area where you have your um, refrigerator that is open to everyone in the unit. We do not put stoves in the units due to fire hazards. Also, our units have their own washers and dryers. It is $165 um, for a single per night, and then it is $110 for our doubles per bed per night. Here at Capitol, we are a gated community. We do have 24-hour uh, security. When you enter the dome, you will be greeted at the receptionist desk by our management company, Sodexo. That is where you get checked in. They explain everything to you, all of our rules and regulations here at Capitol. We are pretty self-sufficient here. We offer all of our tenants three meals a day. We offer two hot meals, and then we offer a grab-and-go lunch. We have a very large dining facility. Breakfast is served from 4.30 to 8. Dinner is served from 4.30 to 8. For lunch, we typically do sandwiches for them to take out to their sites with them. We always have fruit on hand, chips, cookies, and then always bottles of water. They have everything that they need here. Most of the people that are living at the lodge here are going to be your oil workers. We have employees that are from all over. We have some that work with me at Capitol that are from the south. We have some from the neighboring states. Um, and then, the, the, of course, the tenants here are from all over as well. Most of the women that are housed in my unit either work for Sodexo, which is the management company that provides capital with laundry, kitchen, any of those facilities. We have an all-women's unit in place here, and five out of the seven rooms are occupied. So as you can see, the supply of women here is... is <laughs> Our typical customer is an oil company and they would secure a number of rooms for their employees. We are actually a very upscale executive crew launch. When I moved to Shell Creek, and that was about 10, 11 years ago, the road was paved and it was nice, no dust. And uh, we had a very nice living environment. Since the time they milled the road, it's become a gravel road, and when a truck goes by, the dust settles on the house. We were sitting on the back porch the other day, and, and all of a sudden it seemed like it got really cloudy, but it was actually a truck going by and the dust cloud coming over the house. Right where I live, they fracked two wells that increased truck traffic significantly and deteriorated the roads immensely. And in just this past week, they're fracking two more well sites and truck traffic has increased again. Last week when I was coming home on Friday, I passed 57 trucks going to my house. Years past, I maybe passed one, two, five cars at the most. And this Friday, I passed 57 trucks. We've been just overwhelmed with truck traffic on Route 6. The road gets so destroyed that ruts are almost two feet deep. You get so much mud on the, on the underside of the vehicle that it vibrates the engine and then mud caught in the wheel wells that I had to buy a pressure washer to clean the Jeep off so we can drive it actually. You know, we're not looking for financial assistance. All we're looking for is some assistance to maintain the roads so we can make it to town safely. Right now, I've seen people slide into ditches. 
I get complaints from all of our neighbors who are battling the roads just the same as we are. Uh, they're being impact, impacted the same way, replacing shocks, springs, the whole nine yards. Actually, lights have rattled out of their cases on vehicles where they just shimmy down the road and such. All we're asking is for safe roads. A few years ago in Tioga, we were trying everything they, they could uh, before I got involved on the commission to get people to come to Tioga. Now all of a sudden the people just came. I wish we could find somewhere where we could have a level off point. This oil industry is running 250 mile an hour and all the towns around us are running about 25. Uh, you, you just can't keep up with them. We have a lot of RVs coming into Tioga. We've kind of had to get a handle on it. People were just putting them in their backyards, running city services to them. We've had two RV parks now that have started up. There's a third one on the way. As soon as we got all them people in there, our, our sewer system couldn't take it in our lift station. We ended up, we had to replace our lift station out there. There's been a lot of greed that has come with the goodness, especially you're talking on the housing situation. Some of it's just out of line. In our low income housing in Tioga, we have 38 units. They were sold out about eight years ago to a gentleman and he kept them the HUD housing and in the last year he decided that he was going to drop his HUD housing and so he's he's increased it to market base. One of my co-workers lives there and she's a single mother and, and it's to the point she can't afford it anymore. She just works a service job in Tioga and her monthly rent is pushing a thousand dollars and it, it just it's a lot of money for these people that aren't in the, in the oil field. In the works now we have a hundred and ten bed uh, hotel coming to town. Lutheran Social Services is coming into Tioga building a 24 unit income based apartment building. Any open land that's in Tioga is being built on. Watch your step coming up. This is the drilling rig floor, we call it, platform. It's where all the work takes place. It's where all the iron comes together in a nice little nine inch hole rotary table. It's just your traveling assembly. You have the traveling blocks at the top and then obviously the hook right here. And this little component right here is called the swivel. What this does is allow the lower assembly to be swivel without winding your cables up and all that stuff up above. And you can pump the fluid through and and the Kelly is actually the driving tool. You screw that into the top of the pipe, set it down in the rotary, and that's what actually turns it, the octagon pipe there. On the back side over here, you got a safety zone there, and that's when the tongs are put on the pipe. When you're actually making the connection and breaking connections, you have a crush point on the back side. So at any time, both sets of tongs, which are the wrenches that do the, the big pipe wrench that do the work, uh, making and breaking the pipe, you have to stay off the back side of that in case you uh, get crushed in between the back side of the tongs. So you can see we have a red outline noting danger area. You can't be near the rotating equipment with loose clothing. The iron has a rhythm, and that's what I train the guys. It has a rhythm. To get that piece of iron to there, you don't work it there. You let the iron go and you just control it. You get in the rhythm with the iron, you can get in the rhythm with a, a, a dance move. It's the same rhythm, but if you don't get into the iron, you're gonna overwork yourself. So. It's not so much physical, it's just understanding the design of how things are hanging, the way it assists itself in and, and get in with the rhythm of it. That whole demands that we have to do our job the right way and the safest way. It's rugged, but at the same, it's professional as well. We got dress codes, I mean, we have to shave. We have our safety gear that we have to have every day. So there is a dress code, there's a professionalism involved. And what we focus on is just the safety aspect of how to work this iron. Not that that wrench is any different than a pipe wrench, but it's just a different shape and bigger. You're gonna put it on, the, on that piece of pipe the same as you would a 16 inch or 18 inch pipe wrench. It's just different look, different operation, and we try to marry the two concepts together. So, But this process is a tryout. If you can make it through the school, then you have a job placement. So it's like a training, but if you find out that you're not fit for the oil field, then it's either your choice or we see that it's something out of your control, something that you can't grasp. And a lot of people realize that it isn't an easy job. 
and there is inherent dangers involved with it. And, and I think we try to weed that out while they come through here. So they acknowledge that and they can make the better decision whether it's a, a job that they can handle or not. Anybody can work it. It's just a it's mindset whether or not this is the lifestyle you want. Because the lifestyle is rougher than the job. <laughs>a lot of strength on the part of the wives because you have to do things that you never thought you'd have to do before. Our husbands aren't always able to take out the trash and when our tire is flat, he's sometimes hours away and you have to deal with it on your own. And I think that having to be a much stronger woman than a lot of people would think, but it's a good life and the guys that I know who work in the oil field love their families and take great care of their families and are doing this for their families. So there's, there's good things with it, but it is tough. I mean, you have to be strong. This is my second oil patch. Some of the girls have been in lots more than that. A lot of the families that are coming here are coming here because their husband has lost a job in another industry. So this is their first experience in an oil patch. Maybe I'll take a better nap for you later though. It was something that I kind of had vision for when we were in Wyoming. When we transferred up here, it kind of just more naturally happened where there was a few of us that kind of met and then we started going to the park and meeting more people. And last fall, we decided we needed to do something that would make it more accessible to people who weren't already part of our group. So we put our Facebook page up and then that has then allowed people who didn't just happen to run into us someplace to be able to make contact with us. We do about three or four community things throughout the year to support the community and raise funds for things that are of concern within the community. You know, it's widened my circle of friends. I didn't really know anybody. I don't have family here, so they're kind of like an extended family, I guess. You know, it's just good to have support and, and friends, so yeah, it's helped a lot. I think for most of the girls, it's been really helpful. They don't have family here. Their husbands work really long hours, and it's tough days with little ones and trying to keep up with everything and not having anybody to call if you get sick and need to go to the hospital and those kinds of things. Childcare is very hard to find. There's a lot of providers in this town, but they're all full. You're very lucky to find a provider that has any openings, much less an infant opening. I worked for probably six months looking for daycare before he was born grocery shopping, getting through the checkout lines. It's just, especially with with the little one now, it's, it's very difficult. It requires a lot of planning on my part to get there and get out before he's done. The traffic is very frustrating. I know they're working on it. I just, I think I am not the only one that wishes we could just snap our finger and it'd be fixed because we're all tired of it. And healthcare, getting into a doctor is very difficult also. We bought a house and Thank goodness we got one and we're here for a while so got little roots sprouting. <laughs> so it's good to have, you know, um, friends too that you can grow with and, you know, build off of. There is a lot of tension because of the growth. And so there are definitely times that people feel like these new people are coming here and disrupting our lives and that can sometimes spill over into relationships when you're out and about in the community but in general I have found this to be a very welcoming community. After buying this property I was kind of in charge of getting it rezoned to commercial because this was agricultural land and it was a it was a big mess. We we moved in here and we just basically we had no place to stay and no place to park our truck so we moved in here and uh, and did that, well, the community got very upset because we didn't go through the right hoops of getting it zoned commercially. That's good, we're good. We actually got denied changing it to commercial the first time I went through, and then I had to go back and basically plead my case of, you know, we're, we're actually trying to help. I mean, get our 14 trucks off the side streets and out here and, and establish a place that you know, that we can call our own and, and not really hassle anybody in town. Well, you gotta think about it this way. 
us being able to be here takes 15 trucks out of the parking lot of the Walmart. <laughs> Isn't that a benefit to town? <laughs> I think that they, I mean, they have to realize we're, we've come a long ways here to make a living. I mean, and this is basically, you know, the only place around right now that's, that's hopping and, and has worked. Right now we have approximately 20. We have three basically mechanics and 15 guys working for us. And then us three are, we each take a shift, if you will. Right now we're building the shop, so we're all here right now trying to get, you know, we're, we're having to do all the, a lot of the work ourselves because it's too busy to hire anybody up here. Well, I mean, we first started off, we was going to have 10 maximum. You know, that's what we thought. Well, now we have 15. It's just there's an opportunity here to grow. And, and if we can manage it right, we'll, we'll probably keep on growing. We've had to adapt and come up, you know, to here to try to make a living. I mean, it's just, it's the place that there's an opportunity right now. There's not very many in the United States right now. The businesses, they're just not getting the help that they need because the people are heading to the oil field industries. They pay more. My brother owned a restaurant in Partial. He couldn't get help. His staff would leave to get the higher paying jobs and so he just closed it up. He couldn't, he couldn't handle it, especially in the winter time when he was using some students. When they had to go back to school, then he just didn't have any help at all. It seems like a restaurant would be a real money maker because people need to eat. But if you don't have the staff to man it, then you know, what can you do? Now, I don't see the businesses coming. I know in other areas, like in Stanley and Williston and such, they're building, but they don't have the regulations to go through that we do. And I think also that people are reluctant to build on a reservation because they think that they would not be able to, number one, because of all the, the, the regs and such, and that if they decided to go, would they be able to sell? You have the boom and then you have the bust. I know in the 50s there was an oil boom and it was a bust. In the 80s there was an oil boom and there was a bust. You know, so right now we're in the oil boom. So from history, I would say there's going to be a bust. So maybe that's why we're not building up as much as we, we, we should be. Constant motion would be the honest way to talk about it. There are planes coming in, it seems like almost 24 hours a day. There are constantly trucks going out of town and into town. It's those kinds of little ways, I think, that are affecting people most. This isn't going to go away quickly. We're not going to go back to the idyllic days of, you know, whatever that time was. But this is all us now, and, and we have to learn how to live with that. But I still think, honestly, that Williston is a great little town to come and raise a family and to live in. I don't feel any less secure than I did. I don't feel any more threatened. Um, I think we have a good school district. I think we've got a good city. Are there some real challenges coming up? Yes, there are some real challenges coming up. And I'm hoping that the city and the city government can, can begin to address some of those kinds of things. But give it time. We're going through growing pains is basically what we're going through. And I think in a few years when things begin to settle out and there's not this huge expansion and we've settled down to having what we want, I think Williston is still a good place. There are people who have a vision, things they want to add to the city, but we're in the middle of growing pains. It's like having the little two-year-old toddler it wants stuff, it doesn't know what it wants yet, but eventually it figures it out. And I think that's where Williston is right now. With all the people moving into town, people are feeling less secure in their own homes because of all the strangers that are in town. And, and I really think we've got to get past the idea of it's us and them. It's just kind of got to be all just us and some of us are more well off than others and some aren't. But it's all Williston, and it's all going to be Williston for a while.
the pace has really changed in Tioga. We have more people around, there's more traffic. It's very busy now. You used to go downtown to the grocery store and it would take you an hour to get a milk because you'd visit everybody. Now a lot of times you don't know people. But it's still okay because then you get to meet the new people that are coming into town. And it's wonderful to have the change. Just a little bit hard to get used to. We, we like people coming, it's, it's wonderful. Change is inevitable. We're lucky to be part of the change. We're lucky to have youth come in. Our town would die and become a ghost town if we didn't have the change and the youth and the, the oil come in, the, the farming, everything. It's, it's changing, but it, it's, it's a good change. We don't want to die. We want to stay alive and vibrant. We're currently located on County Road 4, which is a highly industrialized road for the oil field. Part of this County Road 4 will also become the future proposed bypass that the state is uh, working with us as a city and a county to put this together. And they put this bypass on a fast track and they tell us they'll start construction hopefully next spring, next summer. The first year it will all be gravel and then they'll come back in 2013, 2014 to put the actual pavement on it. It's all about safety and all these trucks as you see in front of us, it's just been truck after truck they all come through town. They go north, they actually go through the bypass in the city, and it just creates a tremendous amount of pressure. You know, it could take you 40 minutes just to get through town right now because of the volume of trucks and the volume of traffic. This whole subdivision is comprised of approximately five to 550 acres. Up until a couple months ago, this was one big wheat field. Most of these buildings that you see are all oil field related except for one of them. This building here is going to be a 10,000 square foot building, uh, as most of these buildings are. On the other side of the dirt pile here, we see the trucks going down the road and the water haulers. There we've got about 40,000 square feet coming down the pipeline to be ready for springtime. Within this park that you see the buildings up right now, we have approximately 125,000 square feet being built. All these buildings you see out here now are leased or are, have already have been sold. If it's less than a five-year lease, we don't even negotiate. It's gotta be a five-year minimum on up the ladder just because the cost of, for the infrastructure and the roads which we're standing on is very, very, very costly. This area will have the bypass going right through the dead middle of it, right in the heart of it, and uh, which will come up a Highway 85 and just continue northbound and then veer off to the northwest and tie into County Road 4. I mean, we're very fortunate out here to have work, let alone to this magnitude. I mean, we got to feel very blessed and very lucky and fortunate. We just have to keep reminding people of that. More and more of our people are coming back to find jobs and they're moving in with their families. You know, there's uh, extended families living within a home. At my mother's house, my niece is there, and they they go back to Mandaree during the weekend, but they stay at my mother's house during the week, so, because there's no place to, no place in partial for them to live. That's one thing that I've really noticed that families are having to double up, or we're having to go back to, like our ancestors did, and live with extended families because in, in my culture back in the 1800s, we had uh, the earth lodges and whole families lived there, even horses lived there. So we're sort of moving back that way. Discussions at our house are always like, can you imagine living with more people in the house? Our regulars, uh, they have to wait for a table. They don't like that anymore. They, they're used to being able to sit for an hour and, and visit and with their friends. And now they know that they probably should move on because there's somebody waiting to take their place. This is the formal dining room. Like this room last night, it was just full of people and we turned it over two or three times. You have to plan on where you're going to go. You have to make right-hand turns because you can't get on the streets because there's just that much traffic. You wait. We've always been a patient group of people out here, but 
patience is running thin sometimes when you have to stand in line at Walmart. You don't go, you don't go out to Walmart on a Sunday afternoon. Grocery store lines are long. You want to shop locally, but there's a lot of times that you go through the, to the stores and there's nothing left on, on the shelf because there's just that many more people here. We welcome the change. I wish it would slow down a little bit though. Everybody wishes it would slow down. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that we're developing the oil on the reservation and people are benefiting from it. Our socioeconomic status for tribal members is raising and that's good. But the entire region has been impacted. The difference is, is that the state has regulations to address some of the spills and violations that may be happening. On the reservation here, we don't have those codes specific for non-tribal members. So we've had a lot of influx of non-tribal members on the reservation that we cannot cite for beating, truck spills, whatever the, the violation may be. So we are trying to address those issues. And hopefully we can work out some things jurisdictionally with other entities like the counties and the state so we can help resolve those issues and make the reservation safe. That's our main concern. Well, we kicked it around a little bit, have decided to have a little fun because it's just such a crazy, wild place in the Bakken. We start calling it Bakken Central. It's gotten to the point where even the locals shy away a little bit because it used to be a, a fun place to go for coffee. You could spin in there any time of the day or get a tire change, get an oil change in a hurry. But you know, today it's just a mad rush over there, 24 hours a day. We've got four and five registers running and up to 10 people in each line at four in the morning. And they load up like their little cafe over here with the kind of the junk food. That has expanded a lot. They're buying the food, they're buying the beverages, nuts and so forth, because when you go out on a rig, you don't know how long you're gonna be there, is basically what it is. So they're, they're storing up on different things. And then like in the winter time, this is about the only place you can buy some stuff. I've, I've had to buy tire chains here, I've bought a jack here, uh, a lug wrench, um, I've, I've even bought some other jackets and so forth because I, I, I had two of them get wet on a job, so I bought a jacket here. Frequently we'll have 135 trucks overnight in our location and my C-Store manager will be over there until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, a lot of times trying to direct traffic and try to keep them away from our pumps. As they roll in there, they're desperate for a place to park, get some sleep, and there just isn't any place else. A year ago, we spent about a quarter of a million dollars overhauling the bathrooms. The lines were getting too long. Uh, it was just it just unmanageable. Uh, we put in showers at the request of the truckers, and of course, if you have showers, you got to have a laundry. And we got into clothing. You get a rainy day, and you wouldn't believe how the rain gear goes out of the place. Gloves in the winter, about twenty thousand dollars worth of gloves every month. We've been called, I've heard customers call us to Little Walmart and Stanley. We carry a variety of things. We get a lot of buses in where the guys are going to the, to the derrick or to the field, and they stop in, pick up what they need. They'll be picking up odds and ends of clothes they need. Because there's guys living in their trucks year round, and they come in here, they take a shower, they come in here and grab food. They can't go uptown because they've got the trucks. So, you know, we're kind of where they get a lot of things. This year we also got into tire chains, and uh, uh, I'm sure we sold $100,000 worth of tire chains to the oil field as well. We used to have a mechanic shop in the back of our store. It's really turned into more of a tire shop at this point. It's not uncommon to, do, to fix 65 truck tires in the summer, especially when you get that heat and those tires are under a lot of pressure. So it's, it's, we've got three guys back there busting tires most of the time. You have to bump your salary to where you can bring people in. If you don't, you won't have people. You know, we, we give a lot of people a chance to work in our store, and we have a variety of jobs that they can do, but it is, unless you're used to being around a circus, you just, not everyone can do that job. The kitchen is extremely busy. 
We start anywhere from 5.30 till about 8.30, and then we get a little bit of a break, and then it kicks up again at 11.30 to 1.30. We have breakfast bake, which is scrambled eggs, potatoes, and we also put out like McDonald's hamburgers, like a croissant, and eggs and sandwiches, or bacon. And at lunchtime we have cheeseburger, pizzas, and uh, various kinds of sandwiches, and soups, and salads. It's exciting and it's fun and you better learn how to work very hard. <laughs> Your winners are extreme. I thought I was a real tough Montana girl that could handle it, but I'll tell you what, your winners are pretty extreme. And other than that, it's real pretty. Another challenge we've faced is allocations on fuel. There's no fuel. There's a pipeline coming from Montana with, which brings the fuel to this area. It is exhausted, basically. The allocations are there. Um, we've gone to actually having to rail some fuel in. It's the only way we can keep up. It certainly is profitable, but it doesn't come without a price. When I look at what we have here in Northwest North Dakota, we just have a, uh, it's just like a gold rush up here. We're just really fortunate to have this kind of environment, uh, economically at least. Oil's great, you know, if you have it, it's wonderful. But it, it, you still, it seems like you always have to give something up to get something else. And that's kind of where we are now, realizing that. You know, the economy's great. It's great for, for people who are looking for jobs from wherever they're coming from. And the workers are coming from a long ways away, but it's also helped employ locals because there's money to be made here. There's times Milo will say something and I'll just say, well, just remember, you know, if you're not getting a check from the company, then you can bitch, but if you are, <laughs> this is home and this is where we want to stay. We've heard many people say, well, you know, it's just getting too busy here. I think we're just going to pack up and move and sell and we don't want to do that. This is where we raised our family and where our sons are raising their family. And we want to stay here because it's home. Yes, we can extract the oil. Yes, we, we are going to exploit the oil. But do we have to exploit the people? Do we have to exploit the land and the water in the process? I don't think we have to. For the common good, you know, we can all sit down and figure this out. We are not asking for something that isn't due us. Certainly not. We're not asking for a windfall. We're just asking for some um, crucial key plan development. And there's resources out there. And there's funding out there to help us. And we're going to be here, the Mandan Hidatsa people. We've been here from time immemorial. And we're going to be here when this is gone. My children and my grandchildren, I want them to have something here when this day is done and this oil is extracted. I want this land and water to be livable, and I want planned development. Tioga's been through it all. They flourished and they crashed, and, uh, and that's in a lot of people's minds around Tioga. And so we're probably not as aggressive as some of the other communities are going out and sticking your neck out, so to say, for infrastructure needs and stuff, because uh, we, we did get burnt a little bit in the 80s on that. And we're being very cautious about what we do now with this boom. Everybody says this one's a little bit different, but um, I guess we, everybody still remembers the past. With growth, there's pain. But it's a very positive thing. We're happy to have it. I'd rather be fighting this thing, dealing with the oil field, rather than trying to figure out how we're going to be able to make payroll next month. Some people might say, well, you should have been prepared for this because you knew it was coming. Well, <laughs> I don't think so. Not like this. I think this is a real thing. I think that this is going to go on for quite a while. It's technology and demand, and the wells are good. There's a, going to be a lot more oil wells, a lot of them. I don't expect this to go anywhere soon. Shelly, don't stop moving till the sun goes down.
what she wants, what she's not. What she's lost and now found brings them Breakfast in the morning and ice cold beer at night Listens to them talk Breaks up their fight She stands around Boom Ten thousand feet, twenty-two degrees. You find a better place to go. You'd be here too. You know you'd hang around. This program is funded by the North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. To order a DVD copy of Faces of the Oil Patch, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at www.prairiepublic.org and click on shop.